Hey, my name is Ben. Thanks for stopping by. Today we are talking about replacing main electrical panels or even sub panels for that matter. This is something that needs to be done pretty frequently in different structures for a lot of different reasons that we will get into. In this video, I'm going to do my best to cover all of the essential things that you need to know about replacing a panel, the different things that you can sometimes encounter, and general best practices. As you can see right here on the screen, these are the topics of discussion. So as we go through each one of these, hopefully it will give you a good idea of what you might need to do on your particular swap out. If you stay till the end of the video, I'm going to show you guys the results of a poll that we did, as well as just share my own personal experience with how much it actually costs to replace a main panel in a residential application with a standard single phase 240 volt panel similar to this one. So today we're working with Scott. He's been a, a master electrician for how long? 25 years. 25 years. So this is not an unusually unfamiliar thing to him yeah. <laughs> whatsoever. So uh, we're going to be able to do this more efficiently than if I were to attempt to do it on my own because I haven't done very many panel swaps. I've done hundreds. <laughs> hundreds, so that's a slightly more experience. Yeah. We'll start by talking about the reasons why you might want to upgrade your old panel. The first of which is that a lot of times they are severely overcrowded or the panel is just too small for the application. Either they added onto the house or added a garage or several different things onto the building and the original panel just isn't big enough. And that is the reason that we are upgrading this particular one. If you count the spaces in here, we have eight down each side, which means this is a 16 space panel. And as you can see behind me here, this panel is almost all the way full and it is a 30 space panel. So there were 28 spaces that were needed just to serve the existing circuits that were in this particular property. So we've got one double, uh, you'll have a, what, three spaces left. Yeah. And so you went from 16 spaces to 30 and you're still only going to have three spaces left. There, it, there was that much stuff cramped on each yeah. one? Yeah. yeah. I knew it was bad, but I didn't really know how bad. <laughs> In hindsight, maybe upgrading this to a 40 space would have been a good idea, but for the application, it should be fine, and it is way better than it was before we started. So with us needing 28 spaces in that 16 space panel, we had a ton of those breakers that were double tapped, meaning there were two wires going onto the same screw that was supposed to be powering just a single circuit. Now some breakers do actually allow you to have two wires underneath the same terminal on a breaker. However, a lot of home inspectors tend to really not like to see that, even though it technically meets code. The reason it's viewed negatively is that most of the time they wanted to add another whole circuit, but there wasn't any space in the panel, so then they just put that second wire underneath the same screw on a single breaker just to be able to power up that circuit. So it really should have been its own separate circuit, but they just double tapped it instead. Some breakers don't allow double tapping, so it can actually be a true code violation if the equipment isn't listed for it. Another reason to replace your panel is that it adds a bit of future proofing capability to your property. This particular panel is 200 amps, whereas the previous panel was only 100 amps. And that's gonna allow us to, at some point in the future, bring new service conductors in and upgrade this to a larger service without having to change the panel. Now we're gonna talk about the size of your main breaker in your replacement panel. Now, depending on if you have a main panel that is directly fed by the meter, or if you have a sub panel that's fed by another panel, it's gonna change the requirements a little bit. Now, obviously we replace this with a 200 amp main panel that still has a 200 amp breaker in it. Now, the interesting thing about that is that this is being fed from aluminum conductors that are rated for 100 amps. Now, you would instinctively think that that's a bad thing and that we need to replace this breaker with a 100 amp breaker. However, in this case, we do not need to do that because all this breaker is doing is acting as a main disconnect for this sub panel in this separate building. The overcurrent protection for this is actually upstream of this. The breaker feeding these wires is a 100 amp breaker. So this has the proper overcurrent protection. It's just that it's upstream of this location. So it's nice in this situation because we can leave that 200 amp breaker in here as our main disconnect and have the future proofing of being able to bring 200 amp wires in here later without having to change that breaker. Now, if you're working on a regular main panel that just has a 
meter set right outside the house with no breakers uh, out there, then this location will have to have the correct size breaker. So you're gonna wanna go back with whatever the size of your service was before. If you're not changing the wires coming in, if it was a 60 amp or if it was a 100 amp or whatever, you need to go back with the proper sized main breaker because that overcurrent protection is extremely important in that case because it is actually the overcurrent protection and not just a disconnect. One more thing about disconnects is that if you are in a separate structure, like what we are looking at here today, this is a sub panel in a separate building, that is going to require that you have a main disconnect if it is more than six spaces in your panel. If you have one of those tiny panels that only has six spaces, then that actually is adequate and you can just turn those off and it counts as your disconnecting means, uh, even if it's a main lug panel, meaning that the main conductors come in and land on the lugs and are feeding all of these spaces directly instead of having a main breaker, it qualifies if it's six spaces or less. If it is more than six spaces in a sub panel, in a separate structure, you will need to have a main disconnect or main breaker and so you'll have to add something to do that. But if it's just like this situation, we don't have to have the exact size of main breaker because it's just being used as the disconnect and not the overcurrent protection. You can buy replacement main breakers if you have to buy a 200 amp panel like we did and you are future proofing like we did, but you have it being fed from a meter directly and you're leaving the original uh, service entrance cables. You can buy a smaller main breaker to pop in here. They make 100 amp breakers that'll fit right in this space. So I'll make sure to link those in the description. And then of course we do have additional spaces that are available to expand this for additional circuits in the house or to put another sub panel in. I think that's the most likely scenario in this case. You would take those last two spaces and run those to a sub panel either in the garage or another part of the house where it's closer to an addition or something like that. But either way, don't paint yourself into a corner with not having enough spaces. And honestly, we're kind of on the edge of doing that here. A 40 space panel would have been preferred. However, we had this panel available. If you install a used panel like what we did in this situation, you do wanna make sure that you have all of the holes that were in the panel originally covered up. You can't have any open holes going into the panel. It kind of goes without saying, but these are readily available, so I'll link those in the description. The third reason why replacing your panel might be a good idea is that it can improve the safety of your electrical system. By adding a modern panel, it's going to be compatible with modern breakers like arc fault and ground fault and dual function breakers, and just poses less of a risk in general because you'll know that everything is properly torqued down and connected, and there's nothing that's overcrowded or any old loose connections or weird stuff going on. So just by upgrading it, you'll have peace of mind knowing that the panel is installed properly. This video is meant to be for educational purposes only and to give a good idea of what is required when upgrading an electrical panel. However, this is a pretty involved process and is one of the things that probably should be left to a licensed electrician. You need to make sure that the proper permits are pulled and that all work that is done is inspected by the authority having jurisdiction. You'll need to decide on what panel you're going to actually install to replace the original. Now I'll put my top recommendations for panels in the description of this video, but suffice it to say that the bigger the better when it comes to the number of spaces. Just like I was saying earlier, this one is on the edge of being too small even though we almost doubled the number of spaces that are in this panel. So a 40 space 200 amp panel is probably the standard that you probably want to go by. I wouldn't go with anything less than that. And then the other thing that you want to get is one that has a plug on neutral feature, which most popular panels now do, but that basically allows you to use a ground fault or a dual function or an arc fault breaker without having to run pigtails. So this one's actually not plug on neutral. So if we wanted to add an arc fault breaker in here, we would have to get one that has the pigtail that goes up to the neutral bus. Not the end of the world, but just keep that in mind. If you see a really good deal on a panel, it might be because it's an older version that doesn't have that feature. Now, while we're on the topic of arc fault and ground fault breakers, it's a really common question that you run into when you replace your panel are you required to upgrade all of your breakers to be arc fault or ground fault or dual function and generally speaking the answer to that question 
is no, you do not have to in most jurisdictions. If you're replacing a panel and going back with all the original wiring that was there, you should be able to use just standard breakers in place of where the original standard breakers were. But always check with the authority having jurisdiction as to whether or not that is required or not in your particular area. Of course, you can always proactively upgrade some of your circuits to be arc fault. Code requires there to be arc fault in a lot of different locations. And so if you wanted to, you could go ahead and proactively do that. Uh, what that's gonna do is basically give you some additional protection from arcing that could potentially cause a fire. However, one of the issues with doing that with old wiring is that a lot of the time you might turn on that arc fault breaker and the circuit will immediately trip because there's either a shared neutral or just something weird going on with the wiring. Shared neutral is probably the most common thing because if we have, uh, let's say these top two circuits right here, if you have both of those neutrals are in the same box somewhere from those two circuits, if those are tied together, now your arc fault breaker mm. is gonna trip immediately because essentially you have two return paths for the neutral current and so that's gonna mess up your breaker. So there's not necessarily anything wrong with the wires, it's just that it was wired in such a way that it won't work with an arc fault breaker. So just keep that in mind. Uh, you shouldn't have to have them uh, in most areas, but just understand what you're getting into regarding that. Another thing to watch out for when you're doing your panel change is multi-wire branch circuits. And what those are are typically gonna be a 14.3 or a 12.3 cable assembly leaving the panel. That feeds 120 volt devices or lights or receptacles or what have you. Usually the easiest way to identify that is that there will be a red and a black wire coming off of single pole breakers right next to each other. And if we follow these wires up, you can see these ones were extended down. They come out of a single cable up here. It's kind of hard to see in the back, right back in there. But basically there's two hots and a neutral going into this single Romex cable coming out of the panel. And so there is one neutral that is being shared by those two circuits. The important things to remember when you're dealing with this is that you need to make sure that the breakers that feed your multi-wire branch circuit are immediately next to each other for a couple of different reasons. The first reason, that's a practical reason, is that if you don't have them next to each other, you could accidentally put them both on the same phase. If this breaker were moved down one spot, both of the circuits for that 120 volt multi-wire branch circuit would be powered by a single leg or a single phase coming into the panel. And the bad thing about that is you'll have two times as much power going out as the neutral can technically carry coming back because you'd have a single 12 gauge conductor coming back. Now you'd think that that would still be the same problem if you're not really familiar with the way the electrical works with a 240 volt panel. Uh, but the reason that it does work is that uh, these the power being used on this wire and this wire balance each other out. So if you had two toasters that were plugged into the two circuits that these are powering, and you were toasting toast at the exact same time, the current would actually balance out exactly. So let's just say that it was like 10 amps on this wire and 10 amps on this wire. The amount of electricity coming back on the neutral up in here would actually be zero, zero amps because the power is balancing itself out on the two phases. If, however, you just use one toaster at 10 amps, then you're gonna have 10 amps going out here, zero on this other phase, and 10 amps coming back on the neutral. So you never are able to exceed 20 amps of current going through that neutral because any additional current is going to be balanced out by the opposite phase. So kind of interesting the way it works and uh, generally speaking you don't see multi-wire branch circuits all the time. In my experience it's a little bit less common these days but uh, previously it was used pretty frequently. So it's definitely something that you might encounter with the panel change. Now the next thing we got to talk about is uh, how and what type of breakers you're gonna use for your multi-wire branch circuit. As we talked about, you need to have your breakers next to each other for sure, but another option is you can use a double pole breaker that is the correct amperage as well. So we could use a two pole 20 amp breaker instead of these two separate single pole breakers to feed this circuit if we wanted to. 
Now the reason we didn't do that in this particular case is that when we looked at the original panel, we just counted the number of single pole circuits and the number of double pole circuits, and that's what we purchased. And so this is what we ended up with. But I definitely could have considered using a double pole breaker instead had I noticed that before purchasing the breakers. The one thing you do need to pay attention to if you're gonna use two separate single pole breakers is that you're technically supposed to tie the handles together. Uh, depending on the jurisdiction that you're located in, some places enforce this and others do not. I'd be interested if you guys comment down below, what does your jurisdiction require for a multi-wire branch circuit? Do they require it to be a double pole breaker serving that? Or do you always use two separate ones with the handle tie? Or do you just use two separate ones next to each other and don't worry about the handle tie? My understanding is that you need to have a way to simultaneously uh, disconnect your multi-wire branch circuit, uh, but it doesn't necessarily have to simultaneously trip. So using a handle tie is perfectly adequate. And I will link to the correct handle ties in the description of this video uh, so you guys can pick those up. We actually might order some handle ties that are designed for these particular breakers, but as a stopgap between now and when we have those, you can use a piece of 12 gauge THHN, uh, which is basically just a little chunk of scrap 12 gauge wire, and it fits perfectly through the handles and gives you a clear indicator that, hey, these are multi-wire branch circuits and you want to be able to disconnect them simultaneously. It's easy to identify them really quickly when you look in this panel. But let me know down below, are you guys fine with just using wire to tie handles together or do you always get the correct kit for your breaker handle ties? One last thing about multi-wire branch circuits are that it creates a very interesting scenario if you were to ever disconnect the neutral wire that feeds that multi-wire branch circuit. Because basically what happens if you pull the neutral off while this is turned on, it will create a series uh, circuit with the appliances or devices that are plugged into each one of these circuits and what it will end up doing is frying some of the equipment that is plugged into those multi-wire branch circuits. And that's another reason why you only want to put one wire under one screw because if you had a multi-wire branch circuit neutral that was landing right there but there were two wires together and you needed to get that second wire out then you might accidentally disconnect that multi-wire branch circuit neutral and not really think anything of it and potentially fry you know, a bunch of expensive equipment in the building. Comment down below with your stories about multi-wire branch circuits. It seems like there are some crazy scenarios that sometimes play out with people creating a multi-wire branch circuit that originates in more than one panel, which is a big no-no. If you're going to do a multi-wire branch circuit, it has to originate in one panel specifically with each side of the phases coming off of breakers adjacent to each other. Uh, but that wasn't always the case. You would sometimes encounter weird situations. So comment down below and let me know what you guys have seen in the field. Lastly, they actually make uh, breakers that are designed to feed multi-wire branch circuits that are arc fault or ground fault. So you need to pick up those breakers if you are for some reason required to upgrade a multi-wire branch circuit or you're running a new uh, multi-wire branch circuit and you need arc fault, they make a breaker for that and it'd be a double pole arc fault breaker basically with the neutral um, that attaches to that. So uh, just keep that in mind. I'll try to link some in the description, but you have to make sure you're getting the correct stuff if you're ever gonna deal with that. Personally, I really wouldn't bother with a multi-wire branch circuit unless it was like a really specific situation where I needed to do so. In addition to the different panels and breakers that you guys might need for your uh, panel upgrade, I'm gonna link to just a bunch of the other common stuff that you're gonna need, like the cable clamps coming into the panel and your anti-corrosion paste for aluminum connections, as well as a few extras like the Sense Energy Monitor, which as some of you already know if you watch my videos, I am a huge fan. It's just a device that sits right in side of your panel. It has a couple of clamps on the top that will allow you to monitor how much energy you're using and it can automatically figure out quite a few of the different appliances in your house. And the cool thing about them is that we have been working with them for a while now and they offer you guys $25 off if you choose to use the code Benjamin at checkout. So link in the description to your Sense Energy Monitor that you should pick up at the same time as your new panel. I'll link to my video about how to install the Sense Energy Monitor if you guys are curious and I think I also show kind of how that works. When you replace your panel, you absolutely need to disconnect the power. These uh, top lugs right 
up in here are always live and so by turning off the breaker in your existing panel it does nothing to disconnect the power actually coming in. So you either need to turn off the power feeding a sub panel or you'll have a disconnect outside of the house uh, but most of the time for a main panel you're going to have power coming directly from the meter which means you actually need to physically pull the meter out in order to disconnect power to your panel and that is something that needs to be done by the utility that serves your property so you're going to have to contact them and say hey I've got a panel replacement to do I need you to come out and pull the meter and you know right away in the morning and then come back at the end of the day and put the meter back in make sure you get power disconnected fully before you get started once you have your power disconnected it's then going to be your opportunity to look at what you have your existing panel and the existing wires take some pictures of it so that you have good documentation as to the way things were hooked up before and then actually go ahead and label using some white electrical tape is usually the best way to do that in combination with a sharpie and just mark the different circuits with what they are going to also make sure that you mark the ampacity or the number of amps of each breaker that was connected to the existing circuits so that you can keep that in mind when you are choosing the size breaker later on. As you can see this old panel cover here was only identified about a third of the way down. The rest of them are just unknown. So that's something that we will do after the fact, after this is all wired up. You go around and figure out what each circuit is and then label it on the new panel cover. Once you have everything marked as far as your existing conductors and what's there, then you can start undoing all of your connections on your breakers and on your neutral bars and grounding bars. Just take all the wires loose and get them all straightened out as much as possible so that you can then take the panel loose and carefully slide it down off of the conductors or a lot of times it's easier to just pull each individual Romex cable out one at a time. It just depends on your particular situation as to whether or not you can pull them up and out or if you'll have to just take the panel off of where the wires are coming through the panel. When you install the new panel you want to make sure that you follow the guidelines for the locations that panels are permitted to be installed. Obviously you pretty much have to put it back where it was but if you do have some flexibility you want to just keep these dimensions in mind. The requirements are laid out in the National Electrical Code at 240.24 so if you want to review that you certainly can but the basics are the top breaker or the top handle for a disconnect cannot be any higher than six foot seven inches off the ground or just six and a half feet is what I like to think of so I would put this handle right here no higher than six and a half feet off of the ground and then our width in front of the panel this direction uh, needs to be a minimum of 30 inches however in that 30 inches it doesn't matter where the panel is so the space on one side or the other uh, doesn't matter so in this case the panel is all the way up against that wall but from this wall right here out to where I am is more than 30 inches so we are good to go and then to the front of the panel you need to have at least 36 inches where there are no obstructions and that includes like something sitting like down here like if there were uh, any sort of an appliance or anything sitting on the ground right in front of the panel that would disqualify this location you need to be able to walk up all the way to the front edge of the panel for it to be considered readily accessible real quick the best way that you can support this channel is hit that thumbs up button subscribe down below and hit the bell to turn on notifications once you get your panel hanging on the wall there are several things to keep in mind depending on the way that your original panel was set up. If you have a standard main panel setup where you have a meter and then the power comes straight out of the meter into your main panel, then your neutrals and grounds can all stay together and they can all land on the neutral bus right up here in the top of the panel. If, however, you have a disconnect outside, so you have your meter and then a disconnect breaker that feeds the panel inside, uh, you may need to separate the neutrals and the grounds or if the panel that you're replacing is considered to be a sub panel, you also need to separate the neutrals and the grounds. In order to separate the neutrals and grounds properly, you need to install some additional ground bars which can be placed at various places within the panel. In this case, we installed our ground bars up kind of higher in the panel, right there and right here, and that allowed us to 
land most of our grounding conductors coming from our different circuits without having to extend them, which significantly reduced the number of wire nuts that we had to put inside of this panel. Now we're gonna talk a little bit more in depth right now about the neutrals and grounds being separated. And I've covered this at length in different videos, so I'll maybe put a card up here or maybe a couple of links in the description to it as well. But if you're replacing a sub panel, you need to really pay attention to how it was originally wired because you can create a very hazardous situation by separating the neutrals and grounds in a sub panel that doesn't have an equipment grounding conductor going back to the original source. So in this particular case, we have a panel that has some conductors in it that are being fed from several hundred feet across the yard. Now there are only three conductors coming from the source. In this case, the source is another panel with feed through lugs that comes all the way to here. So there's three conductors, two hots, and the neutral. And now the neutral is bonded to the grounding system out in the yard or at the original source. That essentially becomes our effective ground fault current path. That neutral is the way that we trip a breaker if there were to be a short in this panel here. Now, if you were going to be installing a new service, you would have four conductors. That fourth conductor would be your equipment grounding conductor going back to the original source. But since we only have three, we have to wire this as if it were a standard main panel. Prior to the 2008 National Electrical Code, if you were running power to an outbuilding, you were not required to run that fourth conductor. And so prior to the 2008 National Electrical Code, if you're wiring a separate structure and feeding a sub panel in that structure, the requirements were pretty much the same as if you were basically setting a main panel because everything was bonded together with the neutrals and the grounds in that sub panel. And then you also had the requirement of your two grounding electrodes outside unless you could prove the less than 25 ohms resistance to earth and then you could get by with one ground rod and everything was just tied together the same as a standard main panel. All that to say that you absolutely need to leave your neutrals and grounds bonded together in your replacement panel if that's how it was originally set up and if you don't have that fourth grounding conductor. I'll try to explain what can happen if you don't do this really quickly and uh, let me know in the comment section if this makes sense to you. If you separate your neutrals and your grounds in a sub panel that doesn't have a ground wire going back to the original source and you fully isolate the grounds in this panel so the grounds don't have any connection to the neutral anywhere. What will happen when you short 120 volts to the frame of this panel? Inherently, you would think that that would trip the breaker because the electricity is going onto the case of the panel and then from there, it's going onto the grounding bar that is in the panel. The grounding bar is connected to our bare copper wires up here that go outside and attach to our ground rods or our grounding electrodes right outside the panel here, as well as, in this case, it goes back and ties onto a copper water line that is going out into the ground. In theory, that electricity goes through all of those things, goes to the ground. And so you would think that that would be fine and that the breaker would trip. However, it is not true. The resistance from those electrodes or the ground rod to the earth is not good enough to provide a good connection back to the source to allow that breaker to trip. And I have a video that will prove this to you guys. I'll link it here in a card. You guys can go watch it and then come back if you don't believe me, where I tested putting 120 volts straight to a brand new ground rod driven into the dirt and it did not trip. It drew like 10 amps or something, but it didn't trip. So that's what you guys are doing if you separate the neutrals and the grounds in a sub panel that doesn't have a proper equipment grounding conductor going back to the source. So just keep all that in mind when you are replacing a panel. You gotta go back to the way it was wired if you don't have the proper conductors going back to the main panel or the source. So to review now, with the neutrals and grounds bonded together like they should be in this particular case, if you have a short to ground anywhere on any of the circuits or if you had a short to ground here on the panel, it's gonna go through the casing of the panel and through the bonding screw right here in the back and that attaches the neutral bar to the frame of the panel and that provides a connection to our neutral which will allow us to trip the breaker and clear the fault. Now that you understand that, I can safely explain to you why 
we have installed grounding bars separately from the neutrals in this particular panel. The first reason is that sometimes it allows you to just make the installation a little bit cleaner. So you can always add grounding bars even if you don't technically need them. Even though you could technically use the neutral bars, you're going to add the ground bars just to make it easier to install it. The second reason and more important reason in this particular case is that we are future proofing this panel to allow us to bring that 200 amp brand new wire into this panel and separate the neutrals and grounds the way they're supposed to be. So at some point in time we might bring four conductors into this panel, pull the bonding screw out, we'd have to move this one grounding electrode that is connected to the top right here next to the neutral to the grounding bars instead and that would give us a fully separate neutral and ground setup in this particular sub panel. So that's why I still like to put in ground bars even in cases where I technically could have used the neutral bar. It allows you to change that at any time if the main wires coming into your panel at some point in time do change. I would also do this the exact same way with a brand new installation. If I have the meter right outside here and this is a standard main panel, I'm still going to put in those ground bars in case someday this location becomes a sub panel for some weird reason stuff gets upgraded outside or there's a big shop or something they move the service now you have everything separated and ready to go if you do ever need to separate the grounds and the neutrals like I said I've got a video that talks about this issue in depth so if you guys want to learn more uh, and wrap your head around a little bit more that's what that's there for. The next thing we need to be concerned with is extending the existing wires and this is something that you most likely are going to be forced to do in a lot of panel changeouts, especially when you're going from a smaller panel to a larger panel the conductors are just going to be too short to be able to reach the breakers. So you can do this in the gutter space just like you can see in this particular panel we've just used standard wire nuts to extend all of our circuits down to the breakers. Now it is is unfortunate it doesn't look the best it's not really clean looking per se um, but it's just kind of a necessary evil in order for the wires to reach their destinations you can obviously move wires around to, to some extent and try to like pull a little bit extra and do what you can uh, but extending them is just something that you're going to have to deal with now when you go to land all of the wires on your new breakers you want to look at the size of the conductor so either a 12 gauge wire or a 14 gauge wire are going to be your most standard size wires that you're going to be dealing with. And as most people already know, a 14 gauge wire is for a 15 amp breaker and a 12 gauge wire is for a 20 amp breaker. Many times you'll see where there'll be a 14 gauge wire powered by a 20 amp breaker which is too big. So you have to go through and make sure that there's no breakers that are powering a smaller wire. So just keep that in mind. The other thing to keep in mind is what the previous size breaker was that was feeding that particular circuit. If you had a 15 amp breaker feeding a 12 gauge wire, meaning that the wire was oversized, then I would actually go back with that same thing because you don't know where in the circuit it might have went to a 14 gauge wire, which is why they had a 15 amp breaker on it. So don't increase the size of the breakers ever. Go back with what was there or downsize if needed if there was a 14 gauge wire on a 20 amp circuit previously. Now you can see all of our Romex connectors are coming in here at the top of the panel. You can actually run two 12-2 or two 14-2 cables through a single knockout through a single cable clamp or cable connector. From the top of your panel to where they go up into the rest of your framing, you need to have the cables anchored within 12 inches. You can see that the original panel, it was kind of on the edge of whether or not they were meeting that requirement. So if we wanted to improve this, uh, we could slide another board behind these wires here and staple the wires or the cables directly onto that board would be a good option. That's probably the most common solution where you'll see all of your wires are stapled neatly across the back right here. So that's an upgrade that probably could happen here. We just haven't gotten to that point quite yet. So just keep that in mind. Within 12 inches of where the cable clamp is, the wires need to be properly secured. I also wanted to mention that they sometimes do require that you add a bonding bushing on a metallic raceway coming into a main panel if you have unfused service entrance cables coming through that 
particular raceway. So just keep that in mind. You might need to purchase a bonding bushing fitting to connect that to the grounding system. Once you bring those Romex cables into the panel, if there's any extra sheathing, you wanna trim that off so that you have a half inch of exposed sheathing inside of the panel. So when people put Romex in, they leave it this long. Yep. You're only allowed to leave three quarters of an inch. So I always like to get half inch to three quarters of an inch. Yep. What happens is you get homeowners and man, they have sheathing all over every place. <laughs> you can't move it, you can't adjust it. The code minimum is one quarter of an inch for what is exposed in the panel. What that allows for is to make sure that the conductors themselves aren't being squeezed by your cable clamp or connector. If at all possible, my recommendation for your kind of methodology for uh, landing all of your wires is going to be to deal with all the ground wires first. Get all your ground wires off to the side and uh, connect those ground wires to your new grounding bars. If possible, I actually like to put the grounding bar down here in the bottom, but a lot of times with a re panel replacement, you're gonna wanna put the ground bars closer to where they actually come into the panel. Here's a closer up view of that grounding bar installed in the back of the panel here. You can see all of the grounding conductors from the different circuits are landing on it, and it's attached into the back of the panel using a couple of small screws in the pre-drilled holes for that exact purpose. Depending on where you put it, there's different nubs, sometimes I like to call them. Like down here, you can see there's a spot uh, in my main panel. I actually put my ground bar at the very bottom right here, and it lines up with these nubs, and then you use that pre-sized hole right there to connect it. So uh, I'll link to ground bars in the description, uh, but you need to get the one that is compatible with the manufacturer of the panel that you're using. Over on this side, you can see this is our other ground bar installed right there in the back. So that worked really nicely too. It's nice to have them. You can kind of put them wherever you want to inside of the panel as long as there's a spot that was designed for it. And you can add you know, more than two. You can add one, you can add two, you can add three. And in between them, you technically don't have to have like an interconnecting wire because the panel enclosure usually is rated to handle that connection in between. So there's a ground bar over there and there's a ground bar over here. And those are connected via the metal frame of the panel. But you can, if you want to, for the purpose of redundancy, run a ground wire from this one down and around and over to this one just to interconnect them a little bit better. I'd also like to point out that I probably would have hooked this copper wire right here, which is uh, the wire that's connected to the water line. I would have probably brought that into one of these ground bars had it reached. In this case, since the neutrals and grounds are bonded together, since this is technically a panel that's only fed by three wires from the original source, we just went ahead and landed it right there. But if we ever do separate the grounds and the neutrals, we'll have to move that conductor right there to be on the one of these ground bars instead of being connected to the neutrals. We would also have to remove our bonding screw right there to completely separate the neutrals and the grounds in that scenario where we're bringing four new conductors in for a new 200 amp service. Once you've finished landing all of your grounding conductors coming from your grounding rods outside, your UFER if you have one, which is like a footing ground coming from a piece of rebar, your metallic water line, once all those are landed on your freshly installed grounding bars, then you're ready to move on to landing all of your neutrals. In a standard panel with no fancy breakers like arc faults and ground faults, your neutrals are all gonna land on a standard neutral bar like what you see right here. So in this case, all the neutrals did land on those neutral bars because we don't have any of those uh, specific breakers. But if you have some arc fault or ground fault breakers, the neutral actually needs to go to the breaker itself. So depending on your situation, you might land all the neutrals uh, at once like we did in this panel where all the neutrals landed back in there. Uh, or you might do it with the breaker in a minute. On your neutral bars, the maximum number of neutral wires you can have under a single screw is only one. So never put more than one wire under one screw if it is a neutral. However, if it is a ground wire, you can technically add more than one conductor in most panels. However, you need to refer to the manufacturer's instructions to see exactly how many and what gauge wires are permitted to be under a single screw when it comes to ground wires. There's a large screw in there and we're gonna save it for 
like the range wire, this yep. big one back there. Yep, so they give you some spots that are the, able to handle larger conductors, yeah, essentially. Right. While we're on the topic of neutrals, uh, you'll want to make sure that the center wire going to the neutral is marked as such. A lot of the times on older panels, you'll see where the neutral comes in, but it has not been designated as the neutral, it's just a black wire. So you want to make sure that you wrap that up with white tape so that you can see that it is indeed the neutral. The other thing to watch out for is uh, circuits where you have a double pole breaker like this one right here where it goes to a standard 10-2 cable that is feeding a location that is needing 240 volts. However, standard 10-2 is marked as black and white. So what you need to do is tape up that white wire really good and make it so that it is designated as a hot wire. Currently, we have two different instances of that right now where we still have to go back and mark those. On um, this particular breaker right here, you can see there's a white conductor that's being used as a hot conductor, and then there's one more up there. So those need to be designated as hot wires by using some black tape on that white conductor. Now that your grounds and neutrals have been landed except for the specialty breakers, we can move on to actually installing the breakers and landing all of your hot wires. So you're just going to go through and snap in your breakers one at a time and install your black wire onto that or if you have a two pole breaker then you'll be landing both of the hot conductors on that particular circuit. So anything like an oven, an electric dryer or your air conditioners or water heaters, all those are going to have a two pole breaker so you'll land both of your hot wires at once. Make sure that they're designated properly if you're, there are any white wires. Now you can decide as far as how much extra wire to leave in the panel. I have previously in previous videos recommended putting in drip loops where you basically have extra wire coming down and then bring it back up and then land it on the breaker but I've actually kind of leaned back away from that now and recommend just bring your wire down and land it on the breaker where it needs to be and trim it off. That's just gonna allow you to keep the panel much cleaner inside with a lot less wire to deal with and the likelihood of needing to extend them is very low, although right now this is a pretty prime example of why extra wire would have been nice. So that's up to you guys. Uh, drip loops are not very common that people do them, but uh, when I was talking to Scott, the electrician that did this particular panel, he said every time he sees drip loops and he's working on a panel, he oftentimes is very thankful that they're there because the reason he's working on it is because he's changing something and those drip loops make life a lot simpler in those particular situations. I'll link to the video that I did forever ago about my main panel and you guys can see the drip loops that I'm talking about. As you can see in this particular panel, we had to extend most of the hot conductors coming down to our breakers. So not that big of a deal, but it does make it look a little bit more busy. If you have any aluminum service entrance cables or feeder cables that come into your panel, you're going to want to use an antioxidant to prevent corrosion, loosening or heat problems as time goes on on those connections. So make sure that you use that where needed. I'll link this stuff in the description. So we've applied our antioxidant coating to that one, to our connections. Yeah. So you're going to do that one yet, so you're going to pull yeah. that out. Pull it out. Ugh. And then I always put it on the threads. Keeps the threads from se seizing up or whatever. Yep. Yeah. And then get down in there. So then torque it to a certain number of Yeah, pounds. and it's always listed on the panel. I do like three fingers. And because I've had panels with the screws galded, Always make sure. Does that mean, what does that mean? The, the galded is like coarseness on oh. the threads and it stops and you think you've gone, yep. but it never grabbed the wire. Oh, and it, that's it just... from the factory of Square D. Oh, interesting. So I check those and it, you know, it's good, good habit. Yep. And we put a little on the top of that. These have old glue in them or goo in them. Yep. So we we'll shake that down. Yep. Can you okay. just use like Loctite Red instead of that stuff? <laughs> <laughs> nope. Oh. Nope. <laughs> that can go anywhere. Yep. Once you have all of your connections made, you want to go back and make sure that everything is torqued to the correct specifications. On the side of each one of these breakers, there will be a torque specification for how many inch pounds it's supposed to be. And then the torque specifications for your main lugs here at the top will also be 
located here on the side of the panel. So make sure that you torque everything to the correct specifications. Here's a closer look at the lug torque data for this particular panel. You can see we've got a rating of 250 inch pounds for the neutral lug as well as the main lugs. So a lot of really important data is gonna be listed inside of your panel just like this. You can see right there too, it says branch neutral and equipment ground bar torque values. And it's got our different sizes of wire that you can use. And depending on the size, you can see we have different uh, inch pound ratings. You can see all those torque values vary from 50 inch pounds all the way down to 10 inch pounds it looks like depending on the situation. So just make sure you torque everything to the proper settings and then you can really be confident the installation has been done properly. I know a lot of guys don't torque stuff down and if you're an electrician that's been working forever you kind of know what it needs to be but if you haven't done it a lot being able to feel that torque value isn't a bad idea at all. I made a video covering how to torque those connections a little bit more here so if if you guys want to check that out, you're welcome to do so. Phasing typically isn't a concern with the main wires coming into a standard 240 volt panel. You can see that in this case we just have two black wires and neither is designated with red tape. But it's not necessarily a bad thing to go ahead and mark the conductor on the right hand side with red tape. Let me know in the comment section down below, does your jurisdiction require that the right hand wire be phased or taped red, or I've actually seen some other places where they require the left side to be taped red uh, and keep track of that phasing for a single phase application like this. Let me know down below. I'd be curious to hear your thoughts. Around our area, it seems like they don't really bother with that whatsoever. As long as your neutral is marked, you're good to go. Comment down below if your jurisdiction requires that the hot conductors be marked. Most of the time in residential applications, 240 volt single phase, it's really not required to keep uh, one side just specifically tracked. I'll address this briefly, and if you're watching, Scott, I think it looks absolutely flawless and perfect. However, if you want to, you can take as much time as you would like to get everything as neatly trimmed out as you want to. I will also mention that if you guys wanted to, you could use Wagos instead of wire nuts for doing all of your extensions. Uh, depending on how you do it, it might look a little bit cleaner, um, but wire nuts work just as well. The things that I'd recommend avoiding is uh, really sharp corners on your wires. Don't make any like really tight 90 degree bends. It can damage the actual conductor. So what I've heard as a guideline is like if you take the bottom of a Coke can, that radius is about right to uh, kind of give you a nice bend but not actually damage the conductor. The second thing that you might want to avoid that's debatable is zip ties. In my other panel video, I used zip ties and I actually still stand by that and think it's a totally fine thing to do. However, there are a couple things to keep in mind if you're going to use them. The first one is that uh, you don't want to zip tie it crazy tight. You want to have a little bit of space in between all the conductors just to allow the natural movement of a little bit of air. So don't, don't over tighten them if you're going to use them. The second thing is that depending on the inspector, they may require that you cut all of your zip ties out because of that overheating that it could potentially cause. So comment down below, zip ties or no, uh, I'd be curious to see what your guys' opinion are. I like that you can make the panel look a lot cleaner. And the one thing that you can use zip ties on that I've never heard any issues with is all of your ground wires. You can zip tie those to no end. You can tighten them as much as you want because those don't carry any load unless there's a ground fault. And if there's a ground fault, it's going to trip within hopefully milliseconds. Uh, so there's no concern, in my opinion, about zip tying your bare ground wires in any way. You can do whatever you want with that. Some of you probably noticed that this old fuse box was hanging right over here and this actually served the well previously. And the interesting thing about the way this thing was wired before is that this was actually being fed directly off of the lugs inside of this 100 amp panel. So instead of the wires coming off of one of these breakers, it was actually tied into where the mains come in. So there was no fused or overcurrent protection between here where the connection was made and this location where these fuses were, which is why these fuses were required previously for that well pump. So what we did uh, is we just eliminated this disconnect with the fuses in it and went back with a 
20 amp breaker right here that is now feeding the well pump. So that eliminated some unnecessary complexity because it is no longer permitted to tap off of your main lugs to feed something even if it is fused in that uh, disconnect downstream. So that was a significant improvement to have that 20 amp breaker in place of that old fuse box. One upgrade that we haven't done yet that um, it would probably be debatable as to whether or not the inspector would make you do it. Uh, this outlet right here is just connected to a standard breaker and as you can see we are in an unfinished basement here and so this really does need to be a ground fault receptacle. However I am curious whether or not an inspector could make you replace it because this is original. This is what was here before. So we technically didn't really modify or change the way that the uh, building was wired. So I don't know if they can make you do it or not. But in my opinion, it's probably just a good idea to go ahead and do it. Some of these things that you're going to upgrade are going to be proactive decisions that you're making and not just like what is the absolute minimum that I can get by with. Another thing that I would recommend adding to this particular panel is some surge protection. There's no surge protection at this property as far as I'm aware. So adding a surge protector would be a good idea. And actually we are going to do that. And I think we might do it to this exact panel. So make sure to subscribe and hit the notifications bell if you guys want to be notified when we publish that video about surge protection. Now that all of your connections have been made, everything is torqued down and everything is looking fantastic. Now is when you would go ahead and throw in your sense energy monitor. All it takes is to pop one knockout out so that the antenna can stick out to connect to Wi-Fi put a couple of sensors here on your two main legs coming into the panel, and then you'll be ready to go monitoring the energy usage from that panel. If you want the Sense Energy Monitor to keep track of the energy usage on your entire property, you need to make sure that you install it in the main panel after the meter. If you install it in a sub panel, it's only gonna keep track of the power usage at that location and not the rest of the property. It can't track anything upstream, only everything that's downstream. Now at this point we can throw our panel cover back on and then I'd recommend turning your circuits on one at a time and then go through and mark exactly what that circuit is for, especially for circuits that haven't been previously identified. But even for ones that you thought you knew what they were, it's a good idea to just turn them on one at a time. Make sure that it is what you think it is. As promised, the cost to replace a panel like this. In the United States, based on our survey of 345 votes, the cost to replace a panel like this, do a panel change out, labor and materials, on average, appears to be between two and $3,000. Josh will put the results here on the screen so you can see the exact breakdown, but actually, a lot of the time, it can be way more expensive than that. Out of the 345 responses, though, 14% of them actually said that it would cost more than $4,500 to replace a panel like this. And I'm guessing that's probably in some really big markets, some big cities, I can imagine, panels being quite expensive. But then there are about 12% of people that said that it could be $1,500 or maybe even less. So it really depends on the area where you live as to what this is going to cost. I'd say a pretty fair average, though, could be pretty close to $3,000 to do a panel change out like this. So this is no joke and it definitely takes a good amount of time. The electricians that I've talked to have said that doing a panel change out, they like to leave an entire eight hour day. Just plan on that uh, to be able to get everything down and straightened out and put the new panel in and get everything up and running properly. An eight hour workday is a pretty safe bet. And that's as someone who has experience. If you are not as experienced uh, or you're just starting out in electrical stuff, uh, I'm guessing this is probably more like a two-day project. You really don't want to have to rush electrical stuff where you're um, just desperately trying to get everything hooked up because that's when you're going to make mistakes. You want to leave yourself enough time to really feel confident about what you're doing. I realize that this was a massive amount of information and a lot of talking, so I apologize for the sort of boring nature of this video, but it was kind of necessary in order to explain all the different caveats and things that you guys might encounter. Now, I know that I have missed a whole bunch of them, most likely, so comment down below. Let me know the things that we missed in this particular installation, but more so, what are your tips overall? What recommendations do you have for a panel changeout? What are the, some of the weirdest things that you've come into contact with? And so on and so forth. So thanks so much to Scott for uh, spending the day hanging out with us uh, in yeah. 
the basement here. Thanks for putting the panel in for me, guys. Yeah. No problem. That's awesome. For those of you that are interested in helping the channel out, there are a couple ways you can do that. The first one is to just subscribe and like the video and then share it to anyone that you think would be interested. The second way is if you use the links in the description, uh, there are some commissions that can be generated from that. So if you guys need materials or supplies, it doesn't cost you anything extra. And finally, if you would like to support the channel on an ongoing basis, we do have Patreon and you can send a PayPal donation directly if you choose to do that. No big deal at all, I just, some people ask, so. There she be, the new one's in place already. <laughs> oh yeah. That was, that was like an hour ago, man. Are you a fan of Wagos or the push connectors or the... I, yeah, I use all the stuff at the school court. I get some that the wire's so short, you can't work outside the box and they make a straight on um, connector and you can plug it in and then put a six inch whip on it. Yep. And without that, I mean, it'd be impossible. You'd have to pull all the plaster and lath off to get a new wire. This one, you're gonna trace down as best you can. Otherwise, we'll put uh, like a nail on box or something up here. Oh, sure. And mark it as a spare unknown to attic. Yep, but you still put it in a junction box? Yes. Wires hanging like that is a big no-no. Yep, generally exactly. Generally speaking, right? In fact, currently, if you're not using old wires, you're supposed to remove it completely. When you say fully out, I mean, does that mean like you clip it off where it goes up into the wall? Because exactly. obviously you're not gonna, exactly. you're not gonna rip open the walls, right? No, but anything that shows. You, you're not, never supposed to do that. Never supposed to put the same neutral with its same ground. Okay, Because yep. if the lug fails, you've lost your both your ground and your neutral. Yeah. So, so you, that yep. was a problem in an overloaded panel we took out. Yep. It's usually home inspectors that get the pickiest as opposed to just a jurisdiction inspector. Yep, yep. Look at that. Well, it's a little busy, but... So, I'm gonna let you put the panel cover on at your leisure and label it, and you should be golden. Yep, we're good to go. We can go grill some pork chops. So for some reason, from the angle I was looking at the panel, I was thinking we had just two spaces. But if we look a little bit closer, you can see we actually have four. We have one, two, three, and then four on this side over here. So we actually have a little bit of expansion yet. The other thing that we have going for us is that a lot of these circuits, I think, are serving not very many uh, like receptacles. Like one of these might be serving just a few added receptacles in a bedroom, for example. So there'll be room for additional expansion. 